Welcome, welcome, welcome. You guessed it. We're calling all investors. Welcome to another Tuesday with Live with Chaley Ridge. And today we are going to be focusing in on all the creative ways you can borrow money from Chaley Ridge herself. There she is on screen. Can't miss her. And uh, we're going to go through today, can, you know, some of the things you might be aware of, like conventional loans, but then also some stuff maybe you haven't heard of, or even maybe you want to find out more uh, information about. So if you have any questions about anything that's going on here uh, in terms of loan programs, please make sure you use either the chat feature, the Q&A feature, or raise your virtual hand in Zoom. Go ahead and have you ask the question. Things like debt service coverage ratio loans, bank statements, asset depletions, the all-in-one HELOC, and yes, you can use that for primary, second home, and investment property. Cross-collateral loan programs, as well as non-recourse. Shaley, can you help straighten us out on all this stuff? Like, what is all this stuff? I would love to do that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Larry B. Good to see you all. Good to be here again. Um, before I get started, uh, I was thinking about this last night, um, and it was weighing on me. And I want to just take a second, you guys, and outline a couple things that have come up recently. And, and most of you are aware, you know, I'm I'm most of you know my position on interest rates. And while I never pur purport to say that they are irrelevant, irrelevant for real estate investors, um, I always do say that they are less relevant more often than not when you're looking at the bigger picture for investment um, transactions. So uh, as that is um, a thing and everybody is kind of fixated, it's just, it's top of mind for everybody. Everybody always wants to start off by talking about rates. And while that's perfectly fine, I am as transparent as they come. I will give you a rate, you know, right off the cuff. I know a lot of lenders will say, well, I need this, this, and this, and this before I give you a rate. I just need a few questions and we will quote you a rate. Um, so it's not about that, but I, I wanted to dispel uh, a few things related to interest rate as it applies to Ridge lending, um, okay? Because it's come up recently and, and rates have been all over the place and, and nobody knows what's up or down or east or west. Um, and if anyone has any questions, of course, this is an, an open forum, okay? So here's what I would tell you guys. Ridge Lending does not sell rate. We never have, we never will. We do not sell our, our cost or fee structure. We are completely transparent. We show you exactly what we're gonna be making on these transactions. Um, there's no guessing in it and, and the rates are forthcoming as you need them, um, but we don't sell rate. However, a couple of things that I wanna point out about that. Um, we're never gonna be the cheapest in town, ever. There's always gonna be someone, somewhere, somehow that's willing to do it for an eighth of a point less or a quarter point less or a hundred bucks less or a thousand bucks less. Whatever the circumstances are, you're always gonna find somebody that will do it for less than we can do it or they'll undercut or right, they'll price match or whatever it is. I don't get into that game. I believe that my value or our company's value more than um, uh, exceeds what an eighth of a point in rate would give an individual. And especially if you're doing the math, like I'm always telling you to do, I did finally see, by the way, the, the funny TikTok or, or Instagram, if anybody follows us on social, um, my amazing team put together this um, compilation video. If you guys saw it about doing the math, I just saw it recently and I was laughing out loud at myself. It's so ridiculous. Um, but if you're doing the math and you're, an, let's say someone beat us by an eighth of a point or a quarter point, uh, and it's 20 bucks a month, is that worth it? And maybe it is, and that is perfectly fine. But what comes with Ridge Lending Group, you guys, is all of the free information that we get here weekly, one-on-one -on -one time with me, strategy, education, service, the diversity of loan products that you're not gonna find out there everywhere. More often than not, most lenders are gonna be, you know, one size fits all. We are not that. We have that very diverse product line. We're licensed in 47 states. So all of those value adds, I believe, is worth an eighth or a quarter point more in interest rates. So for those of you that know that this particular transaction or whatever it is, absolutely bottom line is the lowest possible rate and cost structure you can find. I get it. You, We would not hold you in, in harm's way. We fully respect that. Um, we would say that we'll always be here on standby if the value adds that I've just presented are more valuable to you at that point. Come back to us. We're going to be here. Uh, and then finally, within this vein, I'm going to tell you guys, make sure that you are comparing apples to apples. When you have a competitor's quote, make sure that what's on that quote is exactly what we're quoting. I can't tell you how many times if I don't see the competitor's quote, 
the individual will come back and say, oh, they quoted me for an owner occupied. Oh, that was for really a second home. It wasn't for an investment property. Their rates for this were more in line with yours. So make sure that those are apples to apples comparisons. And then finally, I would just say that, um, let me preface by saying, I know it's not a good look for a lender to disparage its, competi his, its competition. I'm not giving that, the, I don't wanna give that impression at all. I'm not disparaging anybody. I know that there's a lot of good lenders out there um, that, that hold their clients and they want what's best for them, their, their highest and best use. Um, but there are plenty of situations that I've seen personally where they'll tell you that this is what they can get, but it ends up being something different down the road. Okay, so uh, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Um, that's who we are. You guys need a rate quote, we'll give you a rate quote. Uh, if you are looking for the lowest possible scenario and rate and cost, we're probably not gonna be the, the right lender for that transaction. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Let's get on to uh, what we're talking about today. So um, I've got some notes. Uh, did everybody like, uh, Larry came up with our April, April Fool's joke, the no doc loans are back. That is not, that's not true, April Fool's. Um, okay, so there were a few points. Everybody, uh, I'm gonna give you a quick uh, rundown of all of our products again. Most of you are already familiar with these, conventional Fannie Freddie, our golden tickets, and we can do a deep dive into any of these. Yeah, guys, just raise your hand, put it in the chat, whatever. Um, conventional, most of you are gonna know what that is. Uh, debt service coverage ratio. So non-QM, let me quickly define non-QM for you. Um, QM stands for qualified mortgage. Okay, Fannie and Freddie is the definition of what that is. Qualified mortgages are Fannie and Freddie. Everything outside of that box is now non-QM. Um, extremely diverse product line that's for owner-occupied, second home, non-owner, everything can fit into the non-QM box. Within non-QM, you can have bank statement products where if you can't show a tax return, but you have large deposits um, for, for your business or whatever, we can show 12 months of bank statements, average those out, and that's the monthly income that we're gonna use to qualify you. Asset depletion, let's say you have a million dollars in an IRA, we can use a percentage of that or a portion of that to show income. Debt service coverage ratio is only about the property. We're gonna take the gross rents, short-term, mid-term, long-term gross rents and divide it by the mortgage payment. And if it comes out to be a certain factor, that's gonna qualify for a debt service coverage ratio. All of these are within non-QM, okay? Um, we've got our all-in-one. I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. And then we have um, commercial loans for residential, cross-collateralization. So you can have, it's an actual commercial loan for residential properties, single family up to four unit um, inside one blanket loan, okay? Recourse and non-recourse is gonna be inside of that cross collateralization. I can go into that. So those are the different mechanics and different product types in general that we offer. Now, what I wanted to take a minute and talk about, there's two different ways you guys in which you can open up your current portfolios. Um, those would be using the cross collateralization product or the all-in-one. I'm gonna save the all-in-one for last because that's kind of the, the hook here. Um, let's talk about cross-collateralization. So if you have five properties, 10 properties, 20 properties, 50 properties, whatever it is, and you wanna open up more space for qualifying for more conventional type products uh, or more full doc type products, whatever it may be, you can look at your portfolio and identify of your holdings which properties make sense. Usually it's gonna be the ones that you've had longer that have had a, a chance to stabilize, right? They're actively rented. You've maybe settled out or, or shaken out some property management issues and the properties are performing and they're doing well. Well, maybe you wanna tap into equity or open up more golden tickets, Fannie Freddie spots, for example. In that case, you're gonna go and get a non-recourse, that is key, no personal guarantee, a non-recourse loan, commercial loan, where you're gonna take eight of those mortgages right, residential properties, and put them into one blanket loan. As long as it's non-recourse, we have opened up new Fannie Freddie loans, potentially, okay? That would be one way to kind of stretch out your portfolio. We do that pretty often, not as often as I feel like people should, um, but if you have a large portfolio and you're looking to expand or scale or, or leverage against, that would be the first place that I would look as a cross-collateralization product and see what kind of terms you can get and opening up, um, well, tapping into harvesting equity and opening up more spots for uh, future financing at, at maybe more attractive terms. Um, the second thing, any questions, Larry, that, that maybe need to be answered before I go on? No, <clears throat> no, but thank you for taking an opportunity. So for those that have just joined, because we've had a bunch of people join, um, anybody uh, who's got a question, you can either raise your hand uh, like Devin just did. So we do have one question from Devin. 
um, or you can put it in chat or put it in Q&A. And so, Devin, I've gone ahead and asked you to unmute. So you should be able to see a little thing on your Zoom there that says unmute and go ahead and ask a question to Chaley. Hi, Devin. Hey, hey Chaley, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect. Hey, I uh, really appreciate you putting this call on, first of all. Um, I heard you just mentioned with uh, those blanket loans that uh, people don't take advantage of that option as much as you think probably they, they should or, or maybe they, they could. Would you, would you mind like expanding on when would be a good time to look at that as an option? I guess, when would we as investors know we've reached that like trigger point, so to speak? So I would say a great example would be, thank you for the question, Devin. Um, a great example would be uh, somebody, let's say uh, a team, a husband and wife, we'll just use that as an example. And they've maxed out their Fannie Freddies, their 10 golden tickets, but it's taken them a while. And usually that's the case for most people. It's taken them three, four, five years. They've got, you know, let's say that they were both on their primary residence. So each of them has nine rental properties in their name using those Fannie Freddie loans. Okay, they wanna continue. And while they certainly can get into the non-QM side and keep going that way, those terms aren't gonna be as favorable, right? The non-QM is not gonna be as favorable as Fannie Freddie. So what we might do is look at their overall portfolio and figure out of the properties that they currently hold, which would be a good idea to put into this blanket commercial loan, non-recourse, whereby opening up those conventional loan spots again. So let's say that um, generally speaking, the, the higher interest rates, right? We're gonna probably put those into some kind of a, an ARM, uh, non-recourse commercial loan, maybe some kind of an interest only if we want some, some extra cash flow there. We'd have to look at all the variables, but that would be a great example of say 10 between the, the 18, right? Each of them has nine, they've got 18. Let's say we take 10 of them and put them into a cross collateralization blanket loan. They've opened up for more Fannie Freddies. Right, that would be a, a one of the primary examples I would give for when that would be appropriate. Does that answer your question, Devin? Do you have a, a, a follow up to that? Uh, no, it looks like he's all good. He's giving you okay. the thumbs up on video, Charlie. You're all good. Okay. There is a, so, another question from Rebecca, if you want, and when you're ready. Okay. Let me. I want to get into um, kind of a, a, a part B to what I just went through because it's similar, but it can be used within the all-in-one. Okay. The all-in-one is a first lien HELOC. You guys know it's my favorite. It really is my absolute favorite for its diversity and ability to save massive amounts of interest for the right individual and, and what it provides for you over a 30-year period of time. But taking that cross-collateralization concept, you can do that with an all-in-one. Okay, bear with me for a second. An all-in-one is a single asset loan. So it's not as if you can actually cross-collateralize. You can't take three single families and encumber it with one all-in-one. You can't do that. Only one loan per property. However, if we place it on the right property, and you probably heard me use this, this kind of tagline about the all-in-one, it becomes your own bank. You have become your own bank with this line of credit. So if we choose the right property to put the all-in-one on, so that one of two things, it gives you the highest line limit possible and or the largest amount of available equity possible, you can look at that and then look at, and, and you may wanna be in phase two of your real estate investing cycle, but you can take access, you can grab access to that, look at your portfolio and say, I'm gonna take these four properties over here um, that are, are they're performing okay, or maybe they're not performing as well, and I think they're gonna perform better, pay those mortgages off with the available equity in the line of credit, okay? So now granted, these are gonna be free and clear, but you've opened up more spots and or maybe you want to tap into equity and, and find other other means of, of cross collateraling cross collateralization on those free and clear properties. But the all in one is unique in that you can account for all of those different things that I'm always talking about, plus using it for cross collateralization and opening up opening up more golden tickets. Here's an example of how that might work. So let's say that you've got 15 mortgages. OK. And the all-in-one is on a property that has a large enough line. And you've had these properties maybe for seven, eight, nine, 10 years. So the balances on these existing 15, uh, maybe some of them are lower. Maybe they're 50, 80, 90, 100, whatever it is. But you have enough equity because you put the all-in-one on the property that's going to provide you with a higher limit. And or maybe there's equity in there already. Or maybe you just work it down, right? The equity builds over time. You're going to take that and you're going to pay off those smallers. 
and then you're going to get down below um, the threshold for Fannie Freddie's to open up new Fannie Freddie's. You're going to capitalize on new acquisitions using those Fannie Freddie's, and then you've got these free and clear properties over here, right, that you paid off. One of a few things. We could re-leverage those into some other product in the meantime, um, or look at just taking the extra cash flow and, and accelerating mortgage debt payoff of the others, depending on what phase you are in your, your real estate cycle. Any questions so far, you guys? Anybody? I know that that was kind of a, a lot to chew. There is a couple of regarding what you're talking about. Okay. Um, so with regards to that, um, are you allowed to use the all-in-one for anything regarding like a condo hotel or a condo slash hotel? Um, I know non-warrantable condos are acceptable on a case-by-case. -case. Um, I'll pull up guidelines right now and see what it says about condo tell. And if I can find it while we're on this call, I'll, I'll answer that question. Non-warrantable case-by-case, yes. Condo tell specifically, let me double check that. Okay. What else we got? Um, the other one was, um, can have you ever seen an all-in-one being used as a takeout for a construction loan? Uh, I need more information. So a takeout, you mean just a straight purchase? A hundred percent. So it can um, be. So, no, no, no. So um, where a local banks doing the construction loan and then they, you know, the house is, is planned to be finished. So we come in as residential lending and we, we use an all in one as the permanent financing. Absolutely. What wouldn't be any restriction or limitation to doing it that way. It's just simply a new loan. So probably it's a rate and term refinance if I had to guess. Um, and maybe it's cash out if there's equity, if the ARV is now higher than what you paid for it. Um, but yeah, that that's perfectly acceptable. Good deal. All right. Any others? Uh, um, so the other question was more about a general um, request that was not on the okay. on one. Sure. I'm ready. Okay. So uh, some additional questions that came in were, um, this is from Eustace. And I'm going to sneeze any second. So if you hear me go on you, let me know. His, his uh, allergies. Horrible allergies today, um, which is uh, awesome. So the question is, uh, you just found a four unit building that they're interested in acquiring. And uh, the selling price is around 715,000, but it needs some work. <clears throat> it was recently appraised for 950. So 715 purchase, 950 um, value. Um, they're looking for some way to really come up with down payment. And... Maybe there's a plan if they have other real estate uh, real estate properties that they could refinance to pull cash out um, to really reallocate their reserves for this purchase, Chaley. That's that's something that Eustace has thought about um, doing in terms of possibilities. Like, could that be possible where she could do cash out to use for down payment for the uh, purchase? Of course, of course, we can look at the whole portfolio and see what is um, uh, appropriate, right? reward versus what you're giving up. If you're going to do a cash out on something else, we obviously want to make sure that in doing so, is it still cash flowing? Are the proceeds that you're getting going to be profitable to make up for anything you're losing here, of course. But the thing that occurs to me that I would say off the top of my head in that scenario, Eustace, is um, maybe some kind of a, a short-term bridge loan. If the value really is 950 and you really can get it for 715, if there's any rehab associated um, uh, potentially just to, to get you there, I would say let's look at a bridge loan where we can give you 100% of any rehab and 80% of the purchase price. And then afterwards, we can take the new ARV of 950 and do a rate and term refinance. So depending on what the, the cost basis is and some of those other numbers, your skin in the game may be far less than what you initially thought it might be if we can accommodate or take advantage of that 950 value when all is said and done. Um, if you want, we can talk off, off book and, and really dig into the numbers and see how they play. But if the question was, where are you going to get the 20% down initially? I would say we want to look at that further and, and see what you have access to. If anybody has any questions or a follow-up, you've listened especially on a replay to this, you can always reach out to Ridge Lending Group at 855-74-RIDGE. You can email any of these questions in as, or follow-up questions to info at ridgelendinggroup.com unless you're already working with a dedicated lending specialist. Obviously, reach out to them directly. Um, if you ever want to start just doing an application to get started and schedule a meeting uh, directly with Chaley, you can do that at ridgelendinggroup.com. Thank you, Larry. Of course. Did, uh, did you find what you were looking for, Charlie? I did. Condo tells are not acceptable collateral for the all-in-one, unfortunately. Sorry, guys. No condo tells. That, that's awesome. Information is always powerful. Rebecca, that's 
you. Um, a few more questions, Kim and Shaley. What's your what's your wisher? You go. Uh, you you okay. take them as you think they're appropriate. Okay, cool. So um, there were a couple questions. Uh, this one does happen sometimes where um, you've got U.S.-based investors. Shaley, can Ridge Lending Group help with financing properties in foreign countries? You know, that's interesting. This is probably the third time I've seen this in the last 24 hours. Unfortunately, no, we are we are right now we're um, the contiguous 50 states. Well, and yeah, Hawaii, of course. Um, no, no, Puerto Rico. Um, no, we're, we're only here. We've thought about going outside with some of the US territories. But as of today, that is not the case. However, the flip to that, we do have foreign national financing. So those that are not citizens of the United States that want to purchase property here, we can fund those transactions, just not outside the US. It comes down to yep. title insurance, guys, if anybody cares. Um, title insurance outside the US becomes problematic. And, and um, uh, yeah, lenders lenders want to make sure that that title is sound and that their lien position is solid. And, and it boils down to not feeling confident in that, that way outside of the US. Okay. To continue along with uh, different programs, does Originally Group offer any type of loans for new construction? Um, normally, yes. Uh, we have recently suspended any new construction products that we were funding on. I think it was mid last year um, in preparation for the anticipation of uh, home values deteriorating, uh, the expectation for that. So currently we have no ground up new construction when that comes back, just FYI, we only have it for investment. I have not, um, I've not carried that product uh, for owner occupied. Um, but as of right now, at 1:52 Pacific time on the 4th of April, no ground up construction. I would say that uh, as the wind blows, ask me in 24 hours. It may be different. Um, no, maybe a couple months. Check back in, and we'll see where the um, the markets are, housing markets are, and I might be able have a give you a different answer. So we've gotten a couple of questions, Shelly, because you you talked about your, your favorite loan program uh, of all time, of course, is the all-in-one. So we've gotten a, a couple of different folks. If you could maybe give like the 30-second elevator speech of what it is, why you use it, but then also work into that brief uh, recap as far as um, uh, property types. So you, cause you, because you looked up property types, so somebody asked like something about a condo. So okay. a brief overview and then basic property types that you can do them on. The all-in-one, yep. The all-in-one is a first lien HELOC, you guys, that allows you to become your own bank. It couples a mortgage in the form of an open-ended line of credit, home equity line of credit versus closed-ended 30-year amortized mortgage is closed-ended. You, you make a payment and it sticks. You no longer have access. This is a first lien HELOC open-ended revolving that attaches to checking and savings accounts. That's why it's called the all-in-one. It's called velocity banking or infinity banking. It's actually very common in, in most of the rest of the world. It's, it's fairly um, new to people here. And I think largely because of our GSAs, Fannie Freddie's and, and the amount of money that those make for the United States. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but velocity banking, arbitrage, infinity banking. So you become the person that's in control and how much interest can accrue. So with any HELOC, Interest accrues daily, any HELOC, second lien HELOC, the ones that you guys are traditionally uh, probably know more about. Any HELOC is going to accrue interest daily based on two variables, that day's outstanding balance and that month's interest rate. Okay, so because you're connecting a HELOC and a checking and savings, all of your depository income from all sources, your W-2, your paycheck, um, your, your commissions, your bonus, uh, your gross rents for your, your properties before mortgage payments go back uh, out the door, um, alimony, child support, social security, dividends, interest, it doesn't matter the source of income, all income is going to be deposited in this account, your checking savings, fully automated, nothing changes from this account to the one that you have now with B of A or Wells or whatever, totally the same. But the more you can drive or the more of your depository income you put in there and let sit in there for a 30-day uh, billing cycle for as many days of that 30 day billing cycle as possible, the less interest can accrue. There's a compounding effect at work there. Then there's a second compounding effect that says after all monies go back out the door for all your living expenses at the end of the month, in the meantime, you're going to use a credit card. This is abbreviated. This isn't a very good abbreviated, abbreviated version of this. I think the you elevator use... crashed through the floor already. Did it? Okay. All right. <laughs> so all of your depository income sits in there 29 days out of a 30 day billing cycle. Okay. 
And then whatever is left over also sits in there. 24 seven access. Whenever you need those funds for whatever you need them for, it's available to you, just like it is today. But while it's not being used and sitting in the vessel that it's in now, you're going to stick it in here, drive down the principal balance, save the interest. Okay, that's that's the first thing that that I want to mention about the all in one. But more than that, you guys, it's a 30 year line of credit and a line of credit at your disposal for 30 years that you drive down and, and pull out. You drive down and pull out. So for real estate investors, it becomes very powerful to have this line of credit, AKA turning yourself into your own bank so that you're not having to do cash out refinances every few years, go through the process of, of qualifying and the closing costs of such. It's there for you to use when you need it, for what you need it, how you need it, et cetera. Um, and then Larry, what was the second part that I'm supposed to go over? Property the, types. Property, property types. Sure, property types. Um, there's two investors that we sell to. I'm just gonna pull up one of them because they're roughly the same gang. Hold on one second. Okay, property types is on page. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Property appraisal, property requirements. All right, let's look here. Obviously single family to four unit is acceptable. Uh, Non-warrantable condos are acceptable on a case by case. Where's my acceptable? Eligible borrowers, uh, Larry. Maybe a tough one, huh? So while you're looking that you up, I'm me. just going to answer Thank a couple you. of questions for Chaley because she can only look at one thing at once. So in terms of interest <laughs> I can't, rates, I can't chew gum. They, in terms of interest rates, how these things work, like Chaley mentioned, it's a monthly adjustable based upon an index plus a margin. Um, you want to reach out um, because if you're thinking about interest rate, that is not the way to think about all-in-ones. You can actually look at the simulator at ridgelendinggroup.com. Strongly suggest you set an appointment with one of the dedicated lending specialists to walk you through it. But as Chaley mentioned, it is, it is infinity banking. So honestly, you could have a 2.5% 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and we can show you how that thing, the, the all-in-one blows that 2.5% 30-year fixed out of the water. It's Hands not down. just, yeah, you guys, it's not just lip service. It's true. Let me give you an example. And this, this was useful for me when I first kind of got into understanding the all-in-one. Um, take two loans, take a 15-year, it's, it's velocity of time, okay? It's, it's all about time. Take a 15-year fixed and a 30-year fixed, okay? The 30-year fixed, both of them have outstanding balances of 400,000. That's the principal loan balance, starting loan balance that they, they took out. The 30-year fixed locked at 4%. The 15 year locked at 7%. Immediately, everybody moves to the 30 year at 4%. I would have done the same, right? Before I, I understood all this. Um, when you run an amortization table and you look at how much interest is accrued or paid over 30 years at 4% versus 15 years at 7%, you end up paying $40,000 more in interest on a 30 year at 4%. So the point I'm trying to illustrate here is forget about the rate for a minute. If you're the right candidate for the all-in-one, the rate is irrelevant. It's the, the velocity and the amount of time that, that that mortgage balance is allowed to continue to accrue interest. And, and Larry's right, that simulator, um, it just should be all over our website, you guys. I would get into the simulator. There's no vials of blood needed. It's just simple intake. Just about if you're going to compare it, let's say I encourage you all, everybody's probably, everybody on this call, if I had to guess, has refinanced their primary home in the last 24 months, right? I did. Um, so I would encourage you, your 2%, 2 percent two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, whatever your interest rate is, you can go to the simulator and you can compare the all-in-one to your current mortgage. It's three intake pages, very simple. And the results page will tell you very clearly if this product is for you or if what you have now is the better option for you. There's not gonna be any question. And if you have any questions about interpreting the results or what the input is fields are asking, just let me know and we'll go over it. We'll get on a Teams call and share screen and go over it one-on-one. -on -one. It's kind of cool. I, I actually like doing that to see how the simulator reacts to different people's scenarios. I'm not finding the freaking um, property things, Larry. We're gonna say, we're gonna say, I mean, isn't it a good rule of thumb that if it's eligible for conventional, with the exception sure. of the affordable condos. So right. guys, if, if you've got, if you've got, Jaylee, how would you say it? If you've got owner-occupied second home investment property, one to four units where you can get a normal mortgage on it, you're probably going to be able to use it for an all-in-one. Is that fair? 
I think that's probably fair. The, yeah, the exception would be a non-warrantable condo um, case by case. And, and just guys, non-warrantable just means that it's not insured. Um, it's F, isn't FHA or maybe it's, it's Fannie that does the warrantability, but it has to do with, um, you know, if the, the HOA is in litigation, if the HOA dues are delinquent by a certain percentage, um, if one individual owns more than 10% of the entire project, uh, if occupancy is over 50% rental usage, right? Those are that that determines whether a property is warrantable or not warrantable. And I think that for the all-in-one, for any that that care, it's more about litigation. If the HOA was in litigation, they probably wouldn't engage in a non-warrantable condo. For the rest of it, I think it would probably be acceptable. There you go. So uh, as as we said earlier, for those that jumped in late, um, if you have any questions about this or you want to go through the simulator. Uh, or you just want to follow up on your own um, your own uh, scenario, your own cash flow, things like that, 855-74-RIDGE or uh, email to info at ridgelendinggroup.com. Adani, um, that's awesome that you love infinity banking. You understand it. You just didn't realize you could do it with an investment property. Give Shaley a shout. She'll say, yep. Yep. Investment, second home, owner-occupied. Um, yeah. And before I forget, you guys, this is going to bug the crap out of me. I'm going to go through every one of these 54 pages until I find it, and then we'll post it on the community. Um, before I forget, I am, uh, and Larry, this will be news to you, uh, for the Tuesdays falling on May 2nd and May 9th, those will very likely be pre-recorded for your viewing and listening pleasure, just FYI. Uh, no idea what the content is going to be, but I will not be live on those two days. I don't, maybe I can talk Larry into into it we'll see we'll have maybe we'll do a community call and we'll we'll come up with good chaley jokes for when you come back <laughs> i can't wait i found yeah. it i found uh, it yes adani investment property you're good to go uh chaley yeah. what you think um 10 acre minimum single families including modular are okay manufactured not permitted um condos no litigation permitted that was the big one um yeah 10 acres was the only other extra here that, that we didn't mention. Yeah, otherwise it's just the, the traditional residential properties. Okay. You have time for a couple more last questions. I love it. Not all in one. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so Dan, I'm sorry, excuse me. So there was, Brenda asked the question, um, I know you've talked about syndications in the past. So I'm gonna read the question. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Are you able to add back in losses from syndications that are LLPs in uh, which take accelerated depreciation in the last year when looking to qualify? Uh, it's going to be a little bit outside my wheelhouse, Brenda, but I would say that um, chances are it's going to be on a K-1 and that's already been, uh, the loss or the gain is already going to be listed within that K-1 and in which case the accelerated depreciation, uh, I I don't think so, but would you email me that question and I will get you a, an absolute yes or no, and then maybe we can post it to the community community as well. Please email that to info at ridgelendinggroup.com and that way we can make sure Chaley gets it. Um, great, and so another question that is not all in one um, is, um, can you please help explain the possible impacts or the mechanics or any repercussions of trying to pair off or sell off an individual property that's part of a cross collateralized loan? So within the the uh, loan documents that you signed when you when you purchased this or, or you know secured that loan, it'll tell you exactly what the implications or impact would be. Uh, if you have those, send them to me. We can look through it together. Um, depending on when you got it, you know, any more cross collateralization for residential product, um, they have hybrid provisions that will allow you to take one of the assets and sell it and or refinance it. But generally it requires that you replace that um, with something of like kind or value would be my guess is, is what you're going to find. If, if this is an old loan, like maybe older than 10, 10 years, which is not likely. Most of them are gonna be 10 years max in terms of an arm or a balloon. Um, there may be other penalties that you're gonna to have to pay. And I'll tell you guys on the commercial side, anybody that wants to get in that um, commercial property or uh, commercial loans for residential property, uh, the penalties on those are, are severe. 
you when you get into one of those loans, you need to stay in it. They they either want mortgage maintenance, which means that let's say it's a 10 year term um, and you want to get out of this loan in year five. They're going to calculate the remaining interest in that final five years, whatever they would have grabbed an in interest. And that's what you got to pay in a penalty. Otherwise, it'll be a waterfall 10 to one, keeping that 10 year term in place. Um, year one, you're going to pay 10% of the outstanding balance. Year two is 9%. Year three is eight. Year four is seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So the penalties on, on commercials are, are usually pretty steep. Um, but if you have your loan documents, send them to me and we'll look at them together. There you go. Uh, we've got one last question. Uh, okay. And then, Shelly, if you want to, I'll leave it to you for what you want to do for the rest of the time. Okay. Um, so Jag asked, how complicated do you feel it is to get um, capital appreciation um, out of, uh, you know what, it looks like there was part of a preceding question that Jag. Uh, maybe maybe unmute Jag. Yeah, maybe Jag is Jag. Jag is still here. Jag, I'm going to ask to unmute you. If you Can you mind asking your question? Because it looks like part of it got cut off. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, Shaley. This has been so helpful. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you, Jag. I am uh, I love the concept of the all-in-one. Um, I have a property that's an all cash property that I actually was looking to either refi out of or 1031 out of. And the all in one kind of made sense for that if all the others num all the other numbers worked. What I wanted to do was to put in all the income, income and expenses from three other properties that are held in LLCs as well. So that's four LLCs disregarded all going through the ridge bank account, so to speak. Does that disqualify the LLCs by any chance? No. Or mingling funds or any of that? No, it really shouldn't. Um, <clears throat> but just, just to quickly clarify it, Jag. So Ridge is a direct lender in that we underwrite in house, we fund on our warehouse lines, but we don't service these loans. And in the all in one's case, we are gonna bundle them and resell them on the secondary to the servicer uh, and the, the banks that are holding these are actually FDIC insured depository okay. institutions. Sorry, just, just FYI, it's not a, I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone that cares, North Point and merchants are the two that, that end up picking up the all-in-one. Um, if, if it's just being used for depository on the properties, you know, the, there's a lot of confusion and you need to consult your, your tax professional, right? And, and CPAs, et cetera, okay? I'm not, that's not me. There's my disclaimer. We are um, not a we are not a, a spot for any legal yeah, advice. I thought that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. The I asked is because the accountant had said to set up different bank accounts for the entities. I disagree with that for my own personal. I think it's more of a um, uh, uh, an issue with the CPA and and their ease of of preparing for taxes. Um, when I I've used the all-in-one and I put all the gross rents for, and they were all in LLCs. They weren't in individual LLCs. I don't, I didn't like the series LLC for reasons we don't have time for today. Um, but I did take the gross rents and I put them in there. There's usually a disconnect between the IRS code, right? What's, what is written in the, the governing code and the, um, the underwriting guidelines for the particular loan product, right? There's no connection to those things. And then further, we've got the third piece for asset protection, right? All three of those things live independently of the other one. Right. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Jag, but um, uh, I did it. I know it's very common practice to take all the gross rents, even if they're individually. Uh, let me ask you another question. Do you file um, business tax return for all of those properties or do you put them on your personal Schedule E, and then I guess my follow-up question to that would be: the LLCs um, are they for asset protection almost exclusively, or is there some other reason for the LLC? So they were for asset protection, and right now they are filing through to my personal tax return. Okay. The the asset protection attorney has advised to put them um, to actually look at getting their own um, EIN numbers and and doing it that way. So separating them out, possibly. You know, I would be more than happy to get on the phone with you and or the CPA and just uh, maybe help uh, better inform from an underwriting perspective and, and how it applies to me and what we do. And then understanding from his perspective why you would do it that way um, and, and how it might hinder or help on okay. the lending side. Um, 
yeah, if as it stands today and what you just described to me, I don't think that there's any issue with you putting all of those rents in, in one of the four properties all in one. Um, I would do it. And I'm not giving you legal advice, but I would do it. Okay, thank personally. you so much. Thanks for unmuting me. Sure, yeah, sure. Course. Thanks thank for the question. Thank you very much. Um, last, uh, last type in question here. I, I did an all call. We got one last question here. So Chile is again, focusing on, on the, on the, um, all in one. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase for Martin because he's calling out, um, the wonderful experiences we had in 2008 and nine and 10 with property values, um, decreasing after we all got our lines of credit and after the banks froze those lines and those kinds of things. So that's the, that's the, the backdrop, um, because since the all in one loans are basically lines of credit. Um, what happens or what do you think would happen if they determine the banks determine that the property value has dropped? Um, Is it, it's a very good question, a very valid question. Everybody should be asking this question. Uh, we volunteer this information when we're getting uh, when we're talking to our clients about the LN1. So guys, just to, to bring you up to speed, what Martin is asking, 2008, 2009, right, when home values actually went through the floor, right? I had a, a million dollar property in Florida. I could not short sell that property for three hundred thousand dollars. No kidding, that's a true that's a true story. Um, so first of all, I would say before I get into the the actual specifics, um, the chances of that happening again in our lifetime, I think most most would agree, um, is not just improbable, almost impossible. But if it were to happen, if we were to find what he wants to know is is that if we find ourselves in a situation where home price values drop so low. What is the what is and this is a line of credit based on a loan to value and an initial value of the property and what you what you owe to start with. What happens to this line of credit? Well, first of all, um, you're never going to have access to equity that doesn't exist anymore. OK, so let's just I, I'm going to give examples because I think it's useful for for connecting the dots and retention. Let's say that you started with a uh, line of credit of one hundred thousand dollars and your property value at the time was two hundred just for round numbers. OK. What happens if the value of the home drops from 200,000 to 100,000? Are you going to be able to get 100% loan to value? No, absolutely not. They will, well, they'll probably freeze the line if that if those were the numbers at whatever the existing balance was at the time. I'm talking about limits, not balances, okay? Um, but even back in 08, 09, when this was happening, when, when lines were being frozen, depository income your own ordinary income from your, your sources of um, paychecks and things like that, those monies were, were given back to the individual. Those were not frozen within the accounts. So I think Martin, just to answer your question, you're not gonna get to keep equity that no longer exists, but depository income that's coming from your paycheck, et cetera, will not be held hostage. They would not do that. Um, and then lastly, I would say that if we find ourselves in a place where that could be potential, if we're seeing some writing on the wall where home values are dropping that drastically, and it would have to be drastic for this to happen, okay? We're gonna know about it in advance. It's, it's gonna be, it's, it's not gonna, I don't believe it could ever sneak up on us like it did last time because that was a perfect storm never could, to be created, guys. We had housing and lending imploding simultaneously, unprecedented, okay? Um, but if we did find ourselves in a situation where values were going to take a decrease or a, a, a big, big hit, my advice would be get pull everything out now, right? If you have a line of credit that has a hundred thousand dollar limit and you've got a fifty thousand dollar balance, and we think we're going to be in a place where values are really going to tank, grab that fifty grand. That's what I would do immediately. So if they freeze the line, they're going to freeze it at the hundred thousand, right? Um, you grab the cash. Now you're probably there's going to have you have to figure out the the repayment of that in in terms of the the um, the arm and the adjustments, et cetera. But that would be what I would do in that situation. Uh, Martin, hopefully I answered your question. If not, sir, feel free to email me directly and we can continue the conversation. Thank you, Chaley. You're welcome. Um, there are no other questions coming in from the group. I don't know if you want to wrap this up, this up here. Or if you want to cover anything else. Um, I need some ideas, you guys. I want to know what you want me to be talking about uh, in these these weekly calls. And as much as I, I love this part of, of the work that I do, I don't spend as much time preparing in what the topics are for you, um, just because, you know, work and, and life and et cetera. Um, I wish I had more time to devote just to this and coming up with fresh and unique ideas. I'm not that creative anyway. So I need your help. If you guys have particular topics that you want us to talk on, 
Um, how would you prefer that they send us that information? Just email info, or is there somewhere in the community you want to have them put that layer or yeah, what? I would say I would say the easiest thing to do is to go ahead and uh, if you have specific ideas that you want to make sure Charlie talks about, you can always email into info at ridgelandinggroup.com. Um, we'll go ahead on this replay. We will um, put up a spot for you to give a comment. And we'll okay. ask a question and say, hey, what do you want to hear Chili talk about? And you guys can answer that question on the community. Or, or which guest speakers would you like me to have on? What do you guys want to hear about that isn't necessarily all about, you know, me and just related to real estate, right? Do you guys want um, turnkeys on here that are selling properties in different markets of the U.S.? Do you guys want to have them showcase some of their investment properties? Do you want that kind of stuff? Um, uh, you know, I need to know because, you know, I've, I've learned that logistically trying to coordinate all of that is not as easy as just says, hey, come on to our, our, our weekly thing. It's, it, it takes uh, some effort. So tell me what you guys wanna hear, real estate related, and we'll make sure it, it happens. Absolutely. And again, um, as we said a few times, if you have any takeaways from here today, or if you're listening, please call into Ridge Lending Group at 855-74-RIDGE, or you can email info at ridgelendinggroup.com, or you can go to the website, ridgelendinggroup.com, check out the all-in-one simulator. You'll see it right there at the very top, or you can check out the educational mark for the uh, Certified Power Buyer Program, or just check things out and uh, learn some more. Thanks, uh, Larry. Charlie, we, uh, we had a great turnout today. We had 3,000 people show up, so uh, great job. Wow. Wow. Thank you guys for being here. I'll see you guys next week. Give me some ideas. Bye, gang.